All right, let me take you to the 4th Congressional District. We talked briefly about it, the Paul Mitchell, John Molinar race on the, on the GOP side. So money can't buy everything. <laughs> Paul Mitchell infused $4 million into that campaign, um, and it turned out John Molinar surged ahead with uh, some key endorsements from Dave Camp himself yeah. and um, Bill Schuette and ended up, uh, ended up taking the day there. Surprised that that infusion of cash didn't make that much of a dent? Well, yeah, I guess, although, you know, maybe it did. I mean, Paul Mitchell started really with no political profile at all, and he made the race competitive. And, you know, he spent $4 million doing it. I hope, uh, you know, I assume, I assume that didn't dent him too hard in terms of uh, his lifestyle. <laughs> well, he got $4 million to spend, have it, right? exactly. But, you know, he started from nowhere, and that's what you have to do, I guess, in politics. How else is a guy who has never been in office before, never run a campaign, how else is he going to get out there and make a name for himself. You also had same thing in the, uh, the Amash race out in West Michigan. Uh, Brian Ellis spent uh, a lot more money uh, and, and didn't win. But on the other hand, Dave Trott spent a couple million bucks and did win. So I don't know that you can say money doesn't work in politics yet. It doesn't <laughs> always work. So it's interesting that you bring up the Justin Amash, Brian Ellis race, because um, in um, his acceptance <laughs> speech or his victory speech, Justin Amash really lashed out at his opponent, at Brian Ellis, and said, you owe me an apology right. for the disgraceful campaign you ran, and then um, went after former Representative Pete Hoekstra as well and said, you are a disgrace. Um, you know, usually on election night, everyone it just <laughs> kind of shakes gracious, hands right? and says, you know what, it's, it's over now, now we move forward. What was your reaction to that, Stephen, when you saw that? Well, I mean, I think it's not, it's not out of character for, for Justin Amash, who's a pretty quirky uh, individual and very independent um, and probably didn't appreciate uh, some of the things that were said uh, during that campaign. It was a nasty campaign and uh, they took after him pretty hard. Uh, I think he resents Pete Huckstra, who whose district that's not, by the way. Uh, you know, Pete represented a, a, another district. Um, uh, you know, coming in and sort of trying to muscle him out. Um, you know, this is a fight between uh, Justin and the the GOP establishment on on that side of the state, which really feels like uh, his views, which are which are pretty consistently civil libertarian, uh, just don't fit with what they need uh, out of a you know out of a person in 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 that seat. Um, you know, uh, but he's he's not a he's not you know some somebody you're going to push around uh, and slap around, and he's just going to take it. I mean, he's going to he's going to push back, and so. That's what he did on election night. And apparently it fit with the voters because the constituents, they voted for him. Yeah, they did. And, you know, but normally you would think that victory is vengeance enough. And, you know, it wasn't a very gracious display, but it does explain why so many people out there have had their fill of Justin Amash. You know, he is, you know, quirky is one way of describing <laughs> him. Um, you know, he's, he's rubs folks the wrong way out there. And I think he'd have served himself better with by being a little more gracious. And, and a little more conciliatory and trying to bring the district together. I think he's now guaranteeing guaranteed himself two more years where people are going to be plotting and trying to figure out well, how right, to win another primary this guy. challenge. Yeah. I mean, and the other he's this, got a target on it him. It just wasn't politically smart thing to do. Yeah, no, it wasn't. And, and he's, he's, had, he's had a rough go of him. You think about uh, the, the two terms that he's served. I mean, there's, there's, all, there's always a rancor around conversation about him and what he does. But, you know, I, I, I gotta give him credit. Uh, there are a few people in Congress who you can describe as uh, philosophically consistent, you know, that, that they do what they believe um, almost all the time. And, and Amash does that, you know, whether you agree or not. Um, I think he deserves credit for, he votes his conscience, um, and, and there's something admirable about that. All right, let's, uh, while we wrap up our primary conversation, voter turnout. Um, we talk about this every time, and we alluded to it at the top of the, top of the show today. 17.5% was the voter turnout, and they, this race, or the, this primary, decided some pivotal races, congressional seats, that probably will not change party hands come November. How do we change turnout? Should we be looking to change turnout? And how do we even go about that? And who's in charge of that? Well, there's a couple ways of looking at it, I guess. I mean, I, I agree with Steve. August is a terrible time to hold a primary. But if you look at states that 
that whole May and June primaries. I looked at Ohio's numbers last week. They do a lot better, but it's still like 30%. It's not burning the house down. And Indiana, who holds a, a spring primary, doesn't do all that much better than, than Michigan. So it's not that's not the magic bullet. I mean, you can look at it and say, well, people are dis, dis, feel disenfranchised, disillusioned, don't feel they can make a difference. They feel like you know it's a foregone conclusion. You can say they're just lazy, uninformed, apathetic, uh, what have you. Uh, but on the other hand, you can look at it and say, we seem to have had a very informed electric turnout this this time despite the low numbers I mean I would have not thought prop one could pass based on how horribly written it was but people came out understood it was important for the state yeah. read past the confusing language and voted voted yeah so you had folks making some really good decisions at the polls this time those who did turn out Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that you, you, you've got to move the date, right? Uh, I, I, you, I wouldn't move it to spring. I'd probably move it back. We used to do it in September. September. It's been a long, uh, long, and I'd, been I'd, a long time since mm -hmm. we've done it. So. Yeah, it's only been like five or six years. No. Though, right? uh, we had one in 2001, I remember. 2001 was, was uh, the, right, was, Kwame Kilpatrick's. Yeah. Uh, That's the city primary. Yeah, That's the city primary. Right. primary. Um, but anyway. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think... You know, there are a lot of reasons that people don't vote, um, uh, but I also think it's unconscionable that that because people don't show up for primaries, and we know that, then we put important questions taxes particularly uh, on the primary ballot. You know, proposal one should have been uh, a November Absolutely. issue, as far as I'm concerned. Right. I mean, when when more people any show up, any tax issue should uh, be. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, well, any tax issue, any constitutional issue, the you know the big things that 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 government does. They keep putting them on the primary ballot and, and mm -hmm. sort of trying to sneak things in. I think that's not a well, uh, particularly absolutely outstanding true. thing to do. Um, y you know, you, you, did have, you did have people come out and make some really important and what seemed like reasonable right. choices, but you always wonder, uh, you know, does that make any sense? You have such a small minority uh, deciding, deciding for, for everybody else. That's not the way it's supposed to work. All right. Well,